Yeah, and I, I just got a few other things to mention as well. Um, and that thing that I mentioned earlier on about understanding archaeology when you're actually living it. So if I get me on, that's helpful. Uh, so first things first, I, I've got to oh, he's welcome his air. I haven't washed my hair. It's been raining. Okay, <laughs> that's it. I, actually, I washed my hair. Yeah, that's, that's correct. I even I even took out uh, am ammonia out there, uh, a byproduct of all the sheep pee. But that's life. Right. So okay. So I want to I want to say straight away that we're not doing the Nessa Brodgood today because I wanted to make a fuss of it. Right. I wanted to. Um, I wanted to really get my teeth into it. I will be getting my teeth into what we're doing today. But what I mean by getting my teeth into it, it's a subject that um, because of this virus, I didn't want to muck up in any way, shape or form, because it's something that I'm sure lots of us have been looking forward to. And we've all got a map that's been sent to us in the post, I do believe. Uh, a plan of the Nessa Brodka. That's why we're doing that next week. So... First things first, before we talk about people's news, it's a subject I, I, I would I would like to tell you about, hang on a bit, I would like to tell you about, we're going to be visiting Ireland today, we're going to be visiting Orkney today, we're going to be visiting Somerset today, and we're going to be visiting another part of the United Kingdom, which I'm not going to tell you about, because this other site is big, right? It's another part of the United Kingdom. Now... I, I teach, as some of you know, a class on a Monday. And I teach a class on a Tuesday, as you know, on a Wednesday, two classes on a Wednesday. And on a Sunday, a free-for-all on YouTube, if you get to YouTube, my channel on YouTube, which is quite simple to find, Carl James Lankford, that's me. At eight o'clock on a Sunday, we just basically have people coming on YouTube. They, they can say all sorts of things and they can get me to talk about any subject. And that's what we'll do. Right. So we're trying that out. It seemed to work on Sunday. Um, just gone, except for the first 10 minutes, nobody told me that I was muted because I had somebody annoying like Peter had actually muted me. No, it wasn't. Um, and let me get this right. Peter in um, Devon um, is called Peter and, and Pete from Cornwall is called Pete. Got that right. And the other Peter is from Dorset. That's the one. So I mentioned those classes. The, one of the points made in one of those classes was yesterday, right? And when you, when I, well, this is a general thing. When people present things in archaeology, they say a load of bones are found. Uh, a load of pottery was found. A load of this and that. Um, shell middens well we got into detail what they mean but sometimes we we mention things and we don't really talk about what they actually mean so we were talking about a um, an early medieval site dark age site whatever you want to call it for between the late 400s all the way through to the the 10 hundreds right and roughly in about the 500s the archaeologist excavated there leslie olcock in between 1954 and 1959, this is at Dinis Powers in the Vale of Morgan, South Wales, near Cardiff. He he describes finding um, a shed load of sheep carcasses, obviously the bones from sheep, right? And these dated from roughly the late 400s, 500s. And he said that all of these bones were actually from animals that had not reached maturity to actually breed. Right. And we just put that there and it just shot over my head. And then I realized something. I have actually and um, I, one of my baby lambs, which, which was born, I had to check this. Um, the second baby lamb that was born on the 30th of July. Is actually coming up to two thirds the body weight of its mother. So this lamb is just over six weeks old, and it's nearly two thirds the weight of its mother, right? It's not because we've been feeding these animals not enough, right? They're borrowers, actually from Orkney. They're little sheep, the type of sheep that would have been available in the four, 500s, right? And then it, then it suddenly occurred to me, in, in, in a month and a half's time, that 
that baby lamb will be the same weight as its mother. And in three months later, um, after six, seven weeks, after six, seven months, um, it's reached maturity um, and it can produce lambs, right? I suddenly realized that, um, that the reason why they're butchering these animals at that site in the four five hundreds was because they they have reached their full body weight, um, and you, you're going to get you, you're going to capitalize on that. You're not going to feed them anymore unless you want them to produce baby lambs, right? So I, I've 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 worked out quite easily by looking at looking at the sheep that I've got and I'm rearing that after four months you can slaughter them because they're at the optimum weight required in regards to meat. And, and, and this, is, this, is one thing that, this is one thing that you can do only if you've got access to um, these animals. Other than that, I would have never have known. I couldn't have read that in a book, but because I'm living it, I know it. So that's a, that's a point I wanted to share with you all, a little piece of wisdom. And also everybody, I'd like to thank you all for getting your money's over. Um, that's really appreciated. Um, so what I'd like to know now, that's that's my news of the week. Adam, anything from you? Got no news. Uh, uh, you haven't got any news? No. <laughs> other, than I, other than I watched your video about the Corrosia Stone, um, and my my issue with that is that the, the, the cross above could have been added much, much later. And the inscription for that Corrosia stone, um, for me, um, I'm a little bit suspicious of. However, I'll leave that one there and we can have a chat again. Nice. Cool. Yeah, it, it, it was a good video. I, I was actually surprised of that stone. Um, but if you want to, this is, this, sorry, this is between me and Adam and probably Peter as well. Um, but if you look at the carving of the stone, of the Artoria stone, found by Blackett Wilson, you'll see, you'll see that the, the deepness and the clarity of the letters, they're not the same letters, are very similar. Just, just look that up. You, you'll, you'll, you'll see what I mean when you see it. Right, anyway. Yeah. Uh, what's that, Adam? Okay. Yeah, I'll have a close look. Okay, good, 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 good. Right, Drina, love your glasses as usual. <laughs> no, I haven't got any news this week. Right, talking about miserable uh, Pete, anything you want to say? No, no. He, he could take the abuse as much as I give it to him. Right, <laughs> David, anything you'd like to tell us this week? Thank you. Good. Um, uh, Peter. Um, well, the one bit, but I think you probably did it before I came back, and that was, did you see that Otzi was Turkish? Oh, huh? what? <laughs> no, hang on, hang on a bit, right? No, no, I haven't, no, right, go on. I'm sorry, it's over to you, I'm sorry. You you know more than you, right, just do it. <laughs> I sorry. think you know what, I thought, I, I didn't think, I thought you would have already covered it, so I haven't even no. got anything prepared. But I saw... <laughs> They did some Don't. DNA testing, and uh, they reckon he came from from Turkey. Oh, for God's sake, please! <laughs> right, okay, all right. Um, we're gonna have to look at that. We're, we're, right, okay, I, I'm gonna have to look at that in the break. Sorry. Um, no, you know, I, I, um, well, you know how much access I've got to people quite a lot every single day, every single week, right? And that's one story I've not come across at all. Um, I need to look at that one. And if, if it's if it's in the daily sport, then we know. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. Okay, I, I, I'll have a little look. Right, so the only two ladies left, uh, ladies at the moment, is Anne. No, I haven't heard anything this week. Good. Sorry. Good, good, good. I like the fig leaf, what, what you've got behind you, or oh, it's a leaf. Um, and, oh, God, I can't handle Pat. I don't know where Pat is today, but she looks at, it looks like she's in a disused doctor's surgery. Pat, anything you want to tell us? Right. Um, no. Right. I'm still trying to get the other room painted. Get oh, that's why there's newspapers there. on the wall. All oh, right, sorry. 
I, I just can't work it out. It looks it it looks like it looks like um, a set of um, a medical set that I would have been on in Casualty or something like that. <laughs> um, that's where they do the filming in your house. I can tell. Right. Okay. On that moment, we're gonna we're gonna crack on. We're we're, we're gonna do we're gonna do what we need to do. So. Um, what what we what I do find is that occasionally, well, not occasionally, more than often, is that people send me stuff, and I thought I've got to do that, and this is one of those occasions. I do apologise. This week we've got uh, five fifty images to go through this week. Um, more, just think it's only five images, and we'll get through it really quick. So we, we've got quite we've got a lot. It, it's 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 a lot to go through, and if. Uh, Anne complains at the end, and her, and her head's exploded because there's just too much in it this this week. Then, um, then I understand. Right, okay. So let's go to these images. There they all are. Look at all them. <laughs> there's quite a few. Oh, uh, we look at all that there. For we've got to get start somewhere. Um, there. Good. We're going to start with a, a JCB digger uh, bucket. Uh, very familiar to anyone interested in archaeology, a JCB digger. And we're, we're going to look at a site in Ireland. And for some strange reason, I seem to have cleared my nose for a while. So that's fine. Now, I actually thought this story about, I, I actually thought this story in Cork in Ireland, we'd actually done. Right, but apparently this story was released just a few days ago. In fact, the 7th of September, 2023. It's regarded archaeologists working on the new motorway route in Cork and earth remains of early Neolithic home. Now, I've got to be honest with you, I, I, I've got a bit lost now because it, it seems that in Ireland, they seem to be finding lots of uh, Neolithic houses and the motorways. And I think this is another one. Uh, this is on the route of the M28. And if, if we've covered this already, what, what, it, what it basically is, is that um, this, this site itself, um, the site that they're excavating, and there is a reconstruction of the Neolithic house that they've, that they've found, right? And don't ask. I'm looking at that thinking it looks quite a strange shape. But then again... What we usually expect is roundhouses, but usually in the Neolithic period, they're not. They're more like the one underneath, or they could be like this. I know from personal experience that creating something like this would take a lot of material and a lot of effort, a lot, a lot of structural know-how. And whether this is an accurate reconstruction, I don't know. But what there is, there's a little shed on the side uh, for all their doings. Um, and I've got to be honest with you, that might be practical and it might not be practical. The one thing is that I do know, building a house on stilts is the better option. That's why I've gone with building a house um, on stilts rather than directly on the ground. Because when you build a building off the ground, everything gets damp really, really easily. So they've had 50 archaeologists working at the site. Um, and they're look, working on the route of the M28. And what, what, they've, what they've done is they've covered an area. The archaeologists are working on an area, a massive area they're looking at, an area of 102,000 square metres of ground that they're analysing, which was quite amazing. Other than finding a Roman villa, which is very unlikely on island. Other than finding a Roman villa, they, they found lots and lots of evidence, including Neolithic evidence, Bronze Age evidence. Um, and using the, using the terminologies like this, these, these buildings were owned by some of the most earliest communities, it's saying farming communities in Ireland, um, or some of the more advanced groups in Ireland and interestingly enough this is, this is the reason why we're finding lots of houses in Ireland now this is the ninth such house from that era discovered in County Cork and all have been unearthed during road projects so that's why I got confused because it's almost as if when they're excavating they're finding 
all of these bloody Neolithic houses. So in other words, when you've, when you've got a, a motorway being built in an island, they're going to find a Neolithic house, which seems to be the story. And so, so obviously, go, going back to the idea of being on site when developments are there, this is when the groundbreaking material is being found. More and more of our archaeology is thanks to building development work, except the caveat here is, is that there's less and less building development work going on in Britain that requires archaeologists. Um, so, so and then the site moves on to uh, a, bro a Bronze Age cemetery landscape, which we do know, and we've heard, we've, we've discussed this before, some of the earliest cremations in Britain are to be found in Ireland up to 10,000 years ago. So that skill of cremating bodies has developed throughout the ages, but obviously gone through to the Bronze Age nature and the Neolithic nature of this landscape. So I just wanted to put that in there because I, I was asked to do that actually by one of those on the Wednesday evening, right? So the first, the first bits of today will probably go quite quickly. And then we go to Somerset and then we go to the mystery site where Anne and I go, that is absolutely amazing. Why did we know about that site before? Now, I'm presuming that the, the site in Somerset and the site that we're going to do at the end are sites that none of us knew about and none of us have actually visited. If you visited these sites, just shout out and say, actually, Carl, I knew about these, the, these bits of the landscape. So the next place we're actually going to go to is actually the, the island of Sande within the Orkney archipelago. Well, I did say that we would be looking a lot at Orkney because it's the world of, it's the centre of the Neolithic world, so we're told. And in many ways, that statement isn't too far wrong. So we will look at that. Uh, this just just before just before we move on, because there's uh, we could look at that image in a moment. I want to look at this. This is a map of Ireland. There's something else about that. Now, what we what we do find is that in archaeology, uh, all the barriers have been broken now. And those actually studied archaeology amongst you uh, longer uh, and, and more frequently than any of you other guys who, who just uh, have this interface each week will know that th there's no real textbook for archaeology. Archaeology itself seems to be evolving almost every week. Um, ideas um, and understandings of archaeology are, are evolving. And one, one eight years ago, we used to think everybody lived in caves, and then, then it's like, oh, then everybody lived in roundhouses, and then in the Iron Age, towards the end of the Iron Age, they started living in rectangular and square houses. Well, well, the story is now for some time in the Neolithic period, and actually, uh, maybe earlier, but the Neolithic period, we're, we're quite clear that they lived in both round and uh, rectangular square buildings. And in the Mesolithic period, we see that lots of rectangular buildings are being utilized. So as an archeologist, if you see post holes in the ground and it looks vaguely circular, it could be from any date now. So you've got to go with radiocarbon dating, dendrochronology, or looking for pottery to give you an idea of dating for these archeological sites. Now, I wanted to do this, and the reason I, I found this, I thought, right, I want to do this. And what, what it is, it, inter it interestingly shows uh, that some of, the, some of the most earliest uh, prehistoric sites are to be found associated with the coast, as you can clearly see, particularly in the north. And as we go down the chart, chart, chart here, and we've got cork there as well. Um, Further, further as you go down as well, you actually see um, you see some Neolithic sites that are actually along the coast as well. And this could be to, to do with lots of things, but it's also massively to do with erosion. 
which actually directly leads us to the site on Orkney that we're going to look at next. So that, that basically that map is basically intertidal archaeology. And there was another there was another map like this, and it basically showed that uh, in fact you've got to go way back to see a land bridge between Ireland and mainland Britain. But let's just leave that for the lecture or just ignore it altogether. There's some things in archaeology that you could keep banging the drum, right, and never get an answer. Uh, or you can get an answer and somebody else comes in with something else you don't know how they're all about, right? So we're not going to go there. So intertidal archaeology. Now, I don't know. Uh, Peter, is somebody there trying to get on? Right, okay. I'm just going to have a, just gonna have a quick look. Sorry about this, guys. No, nobody's been asking. No, no, just going to have a... It usually comes up in the, to, to admit, but nobody's asked to be admitted. Okay, don't worry. I, I was admitted to a med hospital once, Pete. <laughs> right, okay. Don't, don't laugh. Yeah. Right, okay. I guess who I met there, John. Right, okay. This site itself is on the island of Sanday. It's an amazing site. And one, one of the things tying in with what we've just what we've just mentioned is that this being on the island of Sanday, this is this is a very very important site on Sanday. Uh, this site was being eroded into the sea. It doesn't look like it was being eroded into the sea, but directly in front of us is actually very where very near where the sea would lap into the site. But I've got lots of images like this, and what I wanted to do is basically give you an idea of comparison and you're not wrong in thinking that this looks a, like a little bit of a miniature version of the site at mid -Howe. and if I just keep blowing my nose throughout the entire lecture uh, we don't need to say excuse me because that's what we're going to have to do uh -huh. so uh, excuse me first one of, one of the one of the massive things with with the wonderful and I can see the images online are coming up really well as well one, one of the massive things with Orkney is that particularly along the coast that's where some of the that's where some of the really good sites are and, and they're being eroded into the sea quite rapidly me and Pete have seen firsthand on the island of Sanday uh, erosion erosion of key archaeological sites and the problem is because there's so much being eroded you've just got to leave it there I had to tell I had to tell the group to basically leave anything there because you know we can't take it all we can't save everything. Um, and that's one of the things with archaeology. So this is this site is the same site there, right? Um, and basically what it is, they're, they're excavating the different phases of this site before it's eroded into the sea. So that's that's really, really important to, to remember. And you can see it's a linear site as well. So again, it, it's quite complex. You've got a side chamber there. Um, and look at this, and you've got these upright stones in it. Really, really interesting site. And this is actually looking out to the sea. And you can imagine that probably in about a decade, this site will be more or less eroded and gone forever. But you can see actually the architecture of this site on the island of Sandy is quite high, quite strong. Did it have a roof on it? There may be signs for that. So this site is located on the southern tip of the Tresnes Peninsula on the island of Sande. Um, and you can see that this is mid Howe, and this is very similar. So this is an island that's quite some miles away from the island of Rousey. Rousey, Sande. So what we need to do, we need to look at a little bit of a plan before any of you fall sick. Uh, let's get the islands um, there. So there we got, we got Sande there. And over there, if we go to there, that, hang on a bit, annotation, good. That there is the island of Rause. Obviously, we know that's Sande. Um, and you can see the difference, but the, the types of chambers that they're building on this island, on these islands, are similar to island to island type 
uh, affair. So as we as we go back again and see the wonders of this wonderful chambered site, and obviously started off as a mound, as these sites do, uh, in a tidal flat known as cat sand. And what, what we do find, and my notes tell me, and this is a data structure report 2019 of the excavations. And interesting, as, as you can see, uh, they, they've got to bag everything up carefully as, as they excavate, because they've got to somehow put everything back to try and uh, mitigate uh, the erosion of this site, uh, which is caused by the archaeology. So one of the biggest problems that we do find in archaeology is archaeological excavation along the coast does cause further erosion. So what we do see is the bioflora and the uh, bioenvironmental effects that archaeology um, has. And, um, and what, what, we, what we've got to do is we've got to be very careful and think, right, is excavating this archaeological site going to help archaeology? Is it going to help the landscape? Is this going to be destroyed imminently or can it be left to, for, to another occasion where we can excavate it without causing too much damage? So this site will be eroded into, into the sea very, very shortly. And you can actually start to see there that the, the, the tide is actually lapping nearby. But it's a, it's a wonderful piece of archaeology. And I, I, can remember, I can remember years ago when I was... Uh, before I had my master's degree uh, with the University of Islands and Islands, they, they basically said, well, why did you bring, bring a team up here and you could excavate somewhere? That would have been absolutely brilliant. But uh, obviously, having that level of confidence to excavate on an island, which is hundreds of miles away from home and not having the resources would be quite fraught. But they were prepared to do that because it's better doing some archaeological excavation than it is to do None at all. A lot of these sites are not protected. They're, they're being found for the first time. So the Khan has suffered greatly from coastal erosion. Its rapidly deteriorating condition led to a joint project uh, with um, the, the National Museum of Scotland and the University of, of Lancaster and obviously uh, University of Highlands Islands as well, having a, um, an influence on the archaeological excavations as well. So this is showing you something that there it is, and there it is being excavated. You can actually start to see that when you do go up and down the coastline, there's this level of landslip. And I remember being on Shetland, and I remember that there was a brook on, um, oh God, it was near one of the um, southern towns in uh, Shetland. Uh, there was a brook, brook. And, um, and it was just being eroded into the sea. This wall was just tumbling into the sea. And my, my lecturer was saying, well, this happens. And interesting enough, I looked down at the ground, there was the base of an Iron Age bowl. And I said, look, Simon, this is going to be eroded into, into the sea. I'll, I'll keep this to show my students and guys as well. Um, hopefully, when, when, the, when my office is up and running down here, uh, I, I will have access to all these artifacts and I'll be able to show you these things in lectures again like I used to. So I would advise taking willy-nilly archaeological artifacts unless you've been advised to do so. So, so these, uh, the, so these um, os osoliths, also stats, these upright stones, being very similar to the ones that made how. This is... This is um, it says here that this is this revealed the remains of exceptionally well preserved, though not particularly well built, Neolithic stalled Khan, with walls surviving to a height of 1.6 meters. Well, I would disagree. It looks actually pretty well made to me. Uh, there are actually five compartments, five individual compartments that that lead into um, the mound, the the landscape there, right? And hang on a minute, not that. Oh, God, I'm looking at some of the wrong lectures now. Oh, not wrong images. So if we go back to there, as we look at the overall view, it's talking about compartments. So you can, you can see the two at the back, uh, but then there's one in front. 
actually we can label these now quite easily. Um, and it's talking about with an entrance passage um, in um, the uh, east side. It's talking about there's actually another entrance from the one that we already know about, right? So that's that's rather interesting that that we that we've that we've actually got that play on the archaeology. So so that that moved away. That's what it looks like. So when it's talking about when it's talking about compartments, right? Compartmentalized. As they've removed all this above and they've gone deeper, what you do find is you find more of a plan within. Archaeology is naturally destructive because that that they've taken away is now that. So this is the thing. Sometimes to actually get detail of an earlier site, you've got to remove what's above to actually get down to it. And you can actually clearly see that there's some kind of roof there on the right hand side, which is describing as some type of entrance. So sort of give you an idea, sort of this, this idea of compartments. So if we sort of list these, sort of give it a go and we'll move that there. So we, we're looking at one compartment there, another one there, another one there, another one there, and another one there. And the entrance way coming in this way. But it's actually at this minute being eroded from this side right so that sort of makes things slightly complicated when you're excavating trying to get that sense of archaeological orientation trying to try to understand what this site really really looks like although uh, one of the things when they were excavating the reason why they go in, th this is the thing when you've got this to level of archaeology um you, you've got to excavate it all um you've got no choice because if you don't excavate it mother nature will excavate it and the other thing as well is, in archaeology, we can't excavate everything. So down the road, there might be another site like this, which is equally well preserved, but you've got to put all the resources into one thing, or you could spread the resources amongst two and not get a complete set of results. So when they excavated this site, they, had, they anticipated human remains, but they didn't actually find any human remains in there. They actually found cremation deposits. Now, this is rather interesting. They found, in, they found one single set of cremation remains. No other human bones. Now, that's rather interesting, don't you think? Why are there no human bones in here? Have they eroded away? Were there ever any human remains in here? Were they taken away by the people who originally put them, the human remains in there? Was this sealed up? All those different things. And also what we've got is the typical Orcadian polished, stone balls right now what we what we like doing in these lectures as you know uh we we like to see we like to work things out and we like to pop onto google among the mass of stone tools inside the structure were 130 scale knives s k a i l l knives or well, where do they come from they come from a site, or they're named after the, the site known as Scale, which is actually where, Scar, where Scarabray is, which is on the main land of Orkney itself. So, so let's have a quick look at this, which is Scale. They should come up straight away. Scale Knives. Let's have a quick look. Scale Knives. There we go. They should come up. Uh, not those scale knives. Oh my God! Where, where's these scale knives? Hang on. No, nope, it's the wrong time. There, there they go. Scale knives. Very strange object indeed. So, it, you know, they're crude, coarse stone tools, usually found in domestic contexts, contexts associated with bludgeoning, butchery and those types of things. But they were actually found inside this building. What the hell were they doing in there? 130 of these objects in this monument. What were they doing there? If surely if this is a burial monument, you'd find lots of bones and you'd find lots of more cremated remains, but you only found there was only one set of cremated remains actually found here. So that's very, very odd. And what we usually find in the Neolithic period 
is actually inhumations rather than cremations, uh, bones that have not been burnt, inhumations. So, so that that very, very interesting point. So lots of these have actually been found at Scarabrea, mainland Orkney, but these are actually found on the Isle of the Sande. So there's lots of parallels and similarities between lots of these sites on Orkney. And usually because, if we go back to my images, usually because lots of these islands were actually linked at one time because the uh, because this is the Neolithic period, uh, 6,000 years ago, the water level was a lot lower than it is today. Uh, water level is rising mm -hmm. on a regular basis around the islands of the Orkney archipelago, very lightly, but maybe in a thousand years time, some of these islands will be threatened with complete flooding like those islands on the South Pacific. Uh, and you don't blame that on global warming. Water levels have continued to rise, nothing to do with human interference, associated with the Orkney archipelago for thousands of years. That's what's happening. Uh, bits of Scotland are rising. Orkney uh, landscape is sort of being subsumed by the waves. So different sort of microclimates, different sort of uh, different things. Uh, what they're saying about these scale lives is rather, rather interesting. My notes, it says their presence within the stall card led to the suggestion, suggestion. And this is only we're only talking about the past few years, not 100 years ago. In the past three or four years, people have suggested that they may have been used for defleshing or preparing corpses for burial. However, there's no, there were no inhumation burials there, except for one set of cremated remains. So excavation suggests that there are a number of phases within this site, and there's lots of evidence of burning, right? So this is the type of landscape that we're talking about from an old map, sort of a spit of land, which would have been much wider at one stage. Keep coming back to that, which we'll come on to. And if we, if we go again, and we think, and we sort of compare that there with this here, and we go with, hang on a minute, I'm, I'm trying to find the one that I had earlier on, but there we go. You can see that uh, it's built in different phases. So obviously that's been removed on the left, and you've got more phases there, and you can see the different phases of build. So this has been built up and changed and altered over a very, very long period of time. How, how long? It's very difficult to say, but it's, it's very likely that this site existed as far back as um, at least four, four and a half, five thousand to maybe six thousand years ago with the varying changes here. Where are the human remains? Where, where are the bones? Right. That's the question. But we don't need to answer that. We're not going to get an answer today. But having an absence of archaeological evidence is sometimes very useful. The monument was also found to have been significantly altered and robbed for stone in the early Bronze Age, uh, with ad additions um, and with additions associated with it, and a kiss burial associated with this site, dating as far back as four thousand years ago. In fact, one thousand. Uh, in fact, three thousand nine hundred years ago, associated with this site. So it continued in use into the Bronze Age. But where are the bones? Uh, if this is a stalled car monument, right? Very, very interesting. That that will, will remain a mystery because they haven't answered that question. We haven't finished with Orkney yet. We haven't finished with the island of Sande yet. So what we are going to do is we're going to move away from that. And we're just going to basically mention that we're going to go to, we're going to go away from that, these images. Uh, here and there. Now, this 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 site is um, th this this is a rather interesting landscape. This is naturally associated with the site that we we've, we've just mentioned. This is associated with cat sand. And uh, do you know what? While I was while I was doing my uh, my master's degree at the University of Highlands, I was offered a place on this excavation, and I said no. Idiot. Uh, and I would have been excavated with one of the foremost 
prehistoric experts in Britain, Professor Colin Richards. He said, oh, why do you come along and get involved? I said, ah, no, I can't be asked, basically. <laughs> but I wish I had. Um, th this, this site itself, as you can see, Pat Sands, they're excavating on the beach. They're excavating the archaeology on the beach, right? And it's only going to be a matter of time before this archaeology just disappears. Very similar to our uh, Tresnes uh, site here. Um, but this, uh, at high tide, this is going to be covered with water. So they're excavated at low tide, and this is uh, likely to be a, a very late Neolithic into Bronze Age building, very similar to lots of those other, and this is a circular building, by the way, very similar to lots of those other ones on the mainland, maybe of similar date to, maybe actually similar date to uh, Scarra Bray, which, as we know, dates to at least 5,500 years ago. But that itself will be all washed away one day. But what they've got, they've got organic evidence as well. Uh, they, they've got uh, these sort of PT organic deposits, right? which is where the archaeology is to be found along, alongside this half and alongside this sort of boundary for whatever building this was. And the other thing as well is sand, as you know, can be very um, corrosive and abrasive to human remains. And um, we are not going to get that type of level of archaeology. But this is being excavated. And I do believe it's still being excavated today. I haven't had the update from the University of um, Highlands and Islands for a while, but they might still be excavating this site because there's lots to be done and lots of students are there uh, to, to understand what, what's there. Uh, so we've got a few people actually watching online and if any of them want to um, sort of, um, if any of them online want to um, comment, then you're very, very welcome. And you guys online, very welcome as well. So, where do we go next? Uh, do you know where this is? I'm asking you all a question. Do you know where this is? No. How many of you have ever seen this? I think no. I have. Hello, oh, stay there, Peter. Anybody else? No. no. I, I did actually give you a clue, right? If you, if you guys were listening, right? I did actually give you a clue, right? This site itself, I said, Island, Orkney and Somerset this week. This is in Somerset. This site, and we'll, we'll, we'll flick quick through a few images. Look at that. I give it away the name. Look at that there. Look at looking out, right? Mm -hmm. This is the Stony Littleton long barrow right now i have not been here right and we're going to show you where it is sometimes wikipedia is very very useful because they've got these little maps and there it is it's there it's the stony littleton long barrow and i just thought i had to do this today because it's it's one of those typical neolithic sites and i might get a little bit upset but then again i might not Am I, gonna, am I gonna attack this site and say, is what you're seeing genuine archeology span has been mucked around with? I might be right, I might be wrong. So that's, that's what we're gonna actually look at now. A nice little bit of information with lots of really nice images. And for me, go on, Peter, what, what's the thing that sticks out with this site? It is in fact, alongside the, alongside the doorway, right? Hang on a minute, we've gotta go back in. You can see the Ammonites were all there. Have you actually been to this site, Pete? Uh, no, I don't think I have. No, no, where you say where it is. No, I'm sorry. I thought I had because it seems uh, familiar. Yeah. But... Yeah. I think you were thinking about Cornwall. I think you may have been thinking about one of those um, Bogus. Yeah, I probably was. Yeah. Actually, blow me, Peter. You know, when you go to on the top of when you go to Tintagel. And there's like a there's like a subterranean hole there which yeah. you can go down and up. That's what that sort of reminds me of. And maybe that's what you saw. I don't it know if you well saw be, that. Yeah. yeah. On the top of that, that little island to Tadjo Castle, there's this thing, weird thing on the top, which I don't think any can, anybody can work out what the hell that is. But if we go, if we go to here, 
and we go to here, I wanted to put this into the mix because this is this is again more of the type of pottery that uh, we, we talk about in these lectures and we, we don't really sort of um, give much of a benchmark. So this this is as pottery actually develops, right? And I'm gonna find my little reference point in the book here, which I'm gonna find now. So this is this is how pottery is developing. So this is actually number A is something known as Fen Gate style pottery, right? And I've actually realized that I've lied to you. We do visit another site before we get to the last site today. So there's five sites that we visit, and that happens to be Fengate. Right, so uh, that pottery there, A, is Fengate pottery. This is how potteries started to develop into the 5,000s and into the um, 4,500 years ago. So you've got A is quite an odd shape, right? And you can see that there's incised marks on it. It's got a really odd rim, right? B is that typical grooved ware that is actually an earlier pottery, more like 5,500 years ago. C is a pottery that we've mentioned before, Peterborough pottery, which is actually found all over the bloody place. In fact, Lots of these places, like the Fengate style pottery number A, is named after the Fengate site near Peterborough, right? And I've said this before. L C, for example, that's um, named after Peterborough. So the original style was discovered in Peterborough, but we find lots of this spread all over the south of uh, England and elsewhere. And we've also got D, that's named after Redstone. That's Redstone pottery. I guess where that comes from. Yeah, Redstone. And we've also got, E's a really interesting one because that's a distinctive type of pottery from Scotland. We get lots of that type of pottery from Scotland. That's from the Southwest. That's called Bichara ware. Okay, you know what that's named after? Bichara. So, so again, this gives you an idea of some of the pottery. And I, and I do mention that because some of this pottery will be mentioned as this lecture sort of unravels. This is why I wanted to put this image in there. And I also want to mention that this is actually, I'm still using the book, Ancient Britain, because other than the faults that I always pick up with Ancient Britain, right, we, I, I do actually mention that um, they have got really good illustrations. And can I just be really naughty with one of you? And I'm going to ask Drina, of all the Neolithic sites that we haven't yet done, uh, Drina, what are we doing in three weeks' time? No, on, I Drina. Didn't. No, 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 on, no. It's, a, it's the <laughs> big one. You don't Come mean... On, street. You mean Stonehenge? No? Yes! Right. <laughs> yeah, we'll do a Stonehenge. Well, not next week, but in, in, in three weeks' time, yeah. We'll do a Stonehenge finally, right? And we'll do five minutes on it. We'll do something more interesting. So, uh, yeah, we'll be doing Stonehenge because Stonehenge goes into the Bronze Age period. What I might do is I might do a bit, I might do a big chunk of Stonehenge, leave it, do a little bit more Neolithic. And then, not too far away, we'll be doing the Bronze Age. We'll be finally kicking into the Bronze Age after all these many months. So here we go. Let's go to this next site. So Stony Little Tun Long Barrow. And it's a very it's it's it is a long barrow in, in, in its very essence. So if we sort of look, it is a typical long barrow. And, and that is actually a cross section of what the long barrow looks like inside. It's crucifix after crucifix after crucifix. Very different than some of the sites um, that you might find elsewhere, like in Orkney. But you've got compart compart compartmentalized. This, if one of you might say it, is, looks a little bit bigger, and it's very similar to Wayland Smithy. And 
West Kennet Longborough. And you'll be right in thinking this is a Cotswold Seven Group uh, monument, but we don't really use those, those words in these lectures because I just think they're a bit obsolete. This is known as the Bath Tumulus or the Wellow Tumulus. So it's given a lot of names, Stony Littleton Long Barrow, Bath Tumulus, Wellow Tumulus, uh, Neolithic Chamber Tomb. And this itself is a site that is one of the earliest scheduled ancient monument sites in Britain. It was scheduled as an ancient monument in 1882. Um, alongside, um, there's, there's also the um, Petra Ethan in West Wales, that became a scheduled ancient monument in 1882. And I do believe Arthur Stone on the Gower was, was one of the earliest scheduled ancient monuments. I think Tinkers with Burial Chamber in America Morgan was as well. So this was, this was seen as being very, very important, a very, very important site. This site itself probably at least dates to 6,000 years ago. So again, this site itself really speaks uh, and you can see the size there. What you've got, you've got, you've got, this is about just under 30 meters long, right? And I went out of my way. I thought, all oh, right, I need you to see this as an aerial view, right? And I did have an aerial view a moment ago. Hang on a minute. Um, nope, not that. Hang on. Where's the aerial view? I had an aerial view here somewhere. Um, I tell you, if we go through it all sensibly, then, then we'll know where we are. We'll eventually get to the area of view because there's so many Ill illustrations here. It's shocking. Right. So uh, what that little plaque is there, it sort of tells you of, you know, the details of the excavation and stuff there. So this, this again, looking into that entrance, it really, really looks interesting. It, it, how much of that is actually genuine from the original archaeology? How much of it is actually genuine? Um, again, looking at this nice little plant there, loving it. I, I love plants like this. And uh, it's, it's a good over 10 metres across as well. So this site itself, we, we know some of the details, not all of the details. This was actually excavated at the beginning of the 1800s. And a number of bones of individuals were actually found. In total, 30 metres long, 12.8 uh, metres uh, long at the front, looking very, very different from the likes of Wayland Smithy. And this is maybe what Wayland Smithy should look like, or maybe it doesn't. The, the site itself is fairly accessible to get to. The, this typical chambered tarn, if it does date from 6,000 years ago, we do believe that it had a usage of at least 1,500 years. Now, are we going to refer to this as being a proper burial chamber? Definitely a burial chamber. Well, maybe I should, because it, because it would be irrespectful, it'd be disrespectful of me not to call it a burial chamber of types. Uh, and we, we look at this, and we understand this, and being excavated by Richard Hall, remember Richard Hall from our Barrow Diggers, between 1816 and 1817, and they had a local labourer with them who gained the entry through the hole, which was made previously in 1760. This site had been excavated or dug into in 1760, not by an antiquarian because lots of the detail of this, it looks beautiful inside. It does look beautiful. Lots of the detail of this were actually removed in 1760. So we don't really know what it really looked like, like because in 1760, they used some of the stone to build the road. So it is quite interesting to think, and it looks quite impressive there today, how much has been reconstructed, if any, because lots of it has been taken away in 1760, which is obviously one of those great terror stories of trying to understand the past. The excavation in, six, in, in 1816, as I said, 70, uh, as I said, 
not 70, several individual remains were excavated. Um, and some of the bones were actually burnt. Now, that little plaque there, if we go, sorry, I've got so many images, I don't know which, which is which now, but that little plaque there is actually a plaque that discusses that in 1858, this mound was restored by Thomas Jolliffe. Now, I did actually, I did actually have an image of that plaque, but I couldn't read it anyway. So I thought, let's let's not bother using it. Uh, but the interesting thing is, is by having somebody go in there restoring it, right? They're actually telling us that they restored it, so we can start sort of asking the questions: what has been restored, right? Rather than not knowing it whether it's been restored or not. But one thing that we can say is that Cole Hall left us a little bit of a legacy of, of reading this site. So if we go along, right, and that, that little plan, which we, which we will find in a moment. This is, this is the plan of Cole Hall in 1816, the cross section, right? So you've got the en entrance on the left-hand side. Um, and if this had been extensively mucked around with by the restorations in 1858, obviously that was on the outside rather than on the inside. So when you actually when you actually when you actually look at this from the inside and out, what you're basically seeing is something that is more authentic than lots of the other sites that we're actually talking about. Some of the artifacts from the excavations are in the Bristol City Museum, but I can say that some of those artifacts in the Bristol City Museum would have been lost in the um, in the um, bombing attack that Bristol um, Museum suffered in the Second World War. So I don't know if all the artifacts actually survived, but it's talking about the Bristol, Bristol City Museum and Art Gallery. <laughs> so this is this is actually in state care. Um, it has been in basic state care since 1884. Let's, let, let's have a little, little look at some of those images inside. As you can see, I went overboard this today, I'm sorry. And uh, you're looking from inside out. And this for me looks a lot more authentic. It really, really does. It looks, it looks right. It's, it sits properly. It looks like, it, it looks like as, as I had, had that little conversation with Peter earlier on, Pete, that it looks like something like a foggy hole. It looks yeah. like one of those corny boggy holes oh, and it looks yeah. more it looks more authentic doesn't it pete it does it does you feel more at home with this one now this is managed by english heritage it's uh there, there's an information board nearby they've they've done further conservation work how what level of conservation work i don't know Geophysical survey work has been undertaken at the site in 1999 or 2000. So this 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 site itself, for me, it, it for me is probably what a barrow should look like. Um, I, I'm I'm not putting all my cards on the table, but if you go with Cole Hall's plan, it sort of shows a little bit before, and and then what you see after. So. Again, we're looking at that and we're thinking how much of this has actually been mucked around with? Maybe more earth on it, maybe some of the side stuff, obviously the plaque there, the, the stones on top of the plaque have, have obviously been altered, right? Um, and if we, if we go back out and we go back and there is an aerial view here, and if I can find it there, we can go. It, it look it looks it looks right. It, it really really does. Um, a, a long trapezoidal, typical trapezoidal earth mound, covering the chamber, and obviously the longest part of the the trapezoidal is where the burial chamber is underneath. So the stony Littleton long barrow uh, is associated with a limestone ridge. And it overlooks the landscape. Lots of these monuments sort of overlook the landscape. I don't know if I've mentioned this before, and I don't know if this is the direct effect with this site, 
But these sights are meant to be seen from a distance. And as you get closer to them, they disappear. And as you get to them, you can actually see them again, right? And maybe I should explain that in a little bit more detail and actually come back to this. So let, let's do a little bit of sketching, which I'm sure some of you actually love my sketching. So let, let's do a little bit of my sketching. Let's get off that and get off that. And we'll do a little bit of my sketching and explain what I exactly mean, right? Because what, what we do find is that what you can find is lots of these monuments are sort of associated with undulating landscapes. And what this effect would have, that say, for example, yeah, it might be a mound or there might be a burial chamber in distance. So if we change that, if, if you've got something sort of by here, which is a mound, and you're approaching it from a distance, you will, as an individual, be able to see this mound from here. So as you, as you sort of go down, the mound disappears and you don't know where the mound is. And you keep going, you don't know where the mound is. And it's only when you're actually on this ridge that you actually see the mound. And this is something typical. This is, this is the effect that we actually typically see with lots of these tombs, that one minute they're there, and one minute they're not. And one of the things that I used to say with, with lots of these tombs, and because it's in a limestone area, you can polish limestone if it's in a, a, a more to a degree, if it's in a chalk area, like Wayland Smithy, or the West Kennet Long Barrow, or the East Kennet Long Barrow, or whatever. From a distance, they use the white chalk to display a site. The white chalk is used to display a site, right? And you can see it from a distance. It gleams. And then suddenly the gleam disappears. And so you try to follow the gleam. The gleam disappears and you keep going and you keep going. And when you're on the gleam, you can see the gleam again. People who study King Arthur know exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about the gleam. One minute it's there and the next minute it's not. And then when you get to it, you actually see it again. So following the gleam, following the mound from a distance. So this is the effect, what the Neolithic um, ancestors gave and offered us. And in many ways, you could say that the Nazca lines, which are only a thousand years old, but bloody hell, it's still a thousand oh. years old. Um, the, 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 the Nazca lines themselves, it, it said that you could only see the Nazca lines from above. But with some of the Nazca lines, you could see from a distance. And then when you get close, you can't see them at all. And when you get to them, you can't see anything. Right. So that, that's, that's the majesty of some of these mon monuments in the past. One minute it's there, and the next minute it's not. With our sites, you can see them. Um, with the Nazca lines, you can't. And also, one thing I'm chucking here as well, before we go back to those images. I, I, used, to, I used to give a good lecture about the, the horses of Wiltshire. Because I'd been to most of them. In fact, in fact, I I was uh, I was in a relationship with a very odd woman, and we used to we used to uh, uh, give an excuse to go out and visit these horses. So we used to visit these white horses all over Wiltshire, right? And one of the things with these white horses in Wiltshire and Uppington Horse, which is uh, obviously in a different county, um, the so you can see them from a distance, but as you get closer and closer, they disappear. And this is something that our ancestors have always done from early prehistoric times. It's an illusion of the eye. And this is what they would do with these types of monuments. So on, on a ridge, right, uh, is constructed by, is constructed using blue lias, right, which is the typical blue lias limestone, the uh, limestone that we actually get, uh, Jurassic limestone that we actually get in South Wales, which is 150 million years ago. But it also uses a forest marble to give more of an effect to the monument. These people were very picky with their building materials. They knew what they were doing. So, so what we'll do, we'll, and the biggest problem is when this site was actually excavated, and we're going to do the ammonite before we have the break, actually. Um, when, the, when this site was excavated, we obviously didn't have as much detail as we would have had if it was excavated today. 
So the gold, the the uh, the, the golden, uh, the grail, the grail of Neolithic archaeology would be to actually find one of these monuments today that hasn't been mucked around with, so we can actually get as much data out of them as we possibly can. But that site that we've just looked at in on the island of Sande, the Tress Nest site, the Tress Nest Khan, we didn't find anything in it. So should we classify all of these as as burial mounds? This one is clearly a burial mound because there's, there's bones being found in it, right? Was it always such a monument? Again, that's a debate, that's conjecture, and that's me sort of throwing all my ideas onto you guys, right? So again, looking into that, looking into the depths, look at this nice little Wikipedia thing there. I'm glad they've arranged, arranged that. And we're loving that fossil, right? And there it is, a little bit overgrown. There's the plaque there, that that plaque there that was that was put there to tell us that you know they've done a little bit of reconstruction. And I'm very grateful for that, which they haven't done at Wayland Bloody Smithy, which they haven't done at West Kerr at Long Barrow, which they haven't done at Stonehenge. Do you want me to go on? But there are plaques at um, Avebury to tell you that certain stones have been moved and altered, which is actually pretty useful. So, um, so what what we have. Is that the you know if we if we if we look and we we go to a plan again so we go to one of those plans we like that one we like this one even better because it's it's actually to be honest with you right that's not too far out that's not bad from that's not bad for the eight, 18, 18 or whatever the date that was done by Cole Hall and, and his colleague Skinner. That's not bad if you compare it with the this one drawn here, right? So if we're, we're looking at that, and it internally consists within the 30 meter long mound, it internally consists of a, um, a nearly 13 meter long gallery from the entrance, which is there, all the way through into the mound, which actually takes up a, a big chunk a big chunk of the mound. Um, as you as you can see, um, the mound looks looks like it was bigger, thirty meters. Well, obviously you could tell that um, um, thirty meters there um, is is you know the proportion of size. But anyway, that take the long gallery, and what you've got is side chambers um, on the left and the right as you go down the gallery. And the passage of the en entrance are roughly aligned. You've guessed it. You've guessed it. To, wi to mid winter, um, mid winter sunrise rather than sunset, mid winter uh, sunrise. Now, all of you that know me for my lectures, I always dismiss this solstice stuff. And the reason why is that I don't think we really understand what it is. It's not about druids. It's not about Celts. It's not about things that go bump in the night. It's not about fairies. It's not about this. It's not about that. Right? It's about something a lot more powerful that we don't rightly understand today. But one thing I will say that might might tie in with this mid winter sunrise is if we go with that. This is why we've got that beautiful image there. Oh, wrong one. I love that image. Actually, there you go. You've got that little bit of light there. But there's always this, this nice stream of light in there, a little bit more clearer there as you're looking out. I'm loving that because the light's coming towards you, right? Okay, tie that in with your, your sunrises and stuff, right? Let's just agree, disagree or whatever, right? But there's obviously something about the light, lighting the back of the chamber. And obviously we know how much light goes in there because this person is taking it without a flash. That has been taken with a flash. That's been taken without a flash. You can you can imagine that there is there is the light in there. You can you've got a, a nice bit of light. The roof stone is made of overlapping stones, and giving you giving you a sense of giving you a sense of support of the earth above. We're not going to go down the avenue whether this is at a roof or not. It did end on. We don't need to even go there. That's not even part of the discussion. Uh, so, so this itself, as, as you're wandering down, and again, again, let's just wander down and you get the experience of the, these, these niches on the left and the right as you're actually wandering down into the darkness, right? Um, and it, it's sort of saying, um, 
from the outside, it stands uh, three meters high, right? So obviously inside, it's a lot lower. And it'd be nice of one of you to have said, what's the experience like when you go in there? How the floor level is today might be different than the floor level was back then, right? And there are some support bars in there as well that have been placed in there in more recent uh, times to sort of keep the whole thing standing. It's likely that it would have been a much lower um, clearance than it is today, right? And maybe if we go to this, it gives you a, a little bit of an extra idea of the floor, that some of it is actually beaten earth, other, other, as, others of it, uh, you've got some stone on there as well. Now, unusually, the barrow is not situated on flat ground like West Kennet Long Barrow. It looks as though it is sliding down the hill, the side of a hill. But again, the effect that I've mentioned, that from a distance, you would see it getting close up, it would disappear. That still stands with this site. We're coming close to nine o'clock and we, we're not going to do the other site which was going to be a little bit of a sandwich site. And then we're going to do the big site. And one of the things that I'd like to ask you as we're going through questions, and I've got to look at what's the ice man as well. When we're going through questions is, has any of you actually been to this site? But we've got to do the Ammonite before we finish. finish. And what we're going to do, we're going to go, we're going to, we're going to go through the images backwards there's the plaque oh yeah I did take an image of, of the plaque that's what it looks like inside very dark towards the end there and there's the plaque you can't really read it uh, be the utmost something or other I'm sure that's translated somewhere but the one thing the point is the point is for that to be in the wall the wall around it must have been reconstructed for that to slot in there, right? So in other words, it looks like the whole wall around the outside, or most of it has been reconstructed. It's, it's, it's almost as if it has been, but the inside doesn't look like it's been mucked around with at all. So we can presume that that's authentic, the entrance mouth there, but the rest of it's been reconstructed. I'll go with that one, fine, it's okay, he's telling us. Um, the Ammonite, the Ammonite. Now, this is the, really the last word other than go back over the images and sort of setting up for questions. So this, this fossilized Ammonite impression um, decorating the left hand door jam has obviously been specially selected by the qu people quarrying the stone and they've used it to display this spiral. Right. They, these people were very much into their spirals. And one thing, one thing that we always do, and I'm a victim of this, we talk about, we talk about, you know, the never ending circle. We talk about cup and ring marks. We talk about this, these spirals that we find on lots of monuments. But maybe they were actually replicating Mother Nature but with the, the spiral associated with the this ammonite the spiral associated with a shell um you know it, it's just this whole thing this 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 whole spiral thing is as much in nature as it's being recreated by by humans within these wonderful monuments so we'll just quickly gently dart over this we know where this site is if you ever get an opportunity to see it, it's near bristol um, and there it is from above. I, I, I had to scour to find this. Again, looking at this, let's not be disappointed. They've reconstructed it. He's reconstructed it that way, whether it's right or wrong, right? We know it's. We know the outside's been re reconstructed, but we know that the inside really hasn't been. Um, do you know what I should be asking you the question? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on Adam. So get your mic on now, Adam. Right, and I'm going to pick on Anne. And the question I'm going to ask you is both Adam and Anne. Is that a genuine reconstruction 
could that have looked like that or whether it, it was the, the mouth there and just earth? Were there, was it a mound of stones? Because we know it's been quarried. Right? What do you feel, Anne? Does that look right? If that was a Neolithic monument unreconstructed, right? We know it's been reconstructed. The stuff on the left and the right of the entrance. Does, does that look like what a Neolithic monument could have looked like, Anne? This is a possibility, but it does seem sort of the walls are built up to 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 the roof, and it, when it's a, a barrow, I'm not sure that that those that shape would have been used. I'm not sure. We're, we're, uh, this is the thing. The, the way it builds up to the yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what I I can see what you say. Um, one of the things in archaeology, what we talk about is the. I, I will, right, we, we, we'll, we'll, we'll use this a minute. We'll come on to you now in a minute, Adam, right? So um, what we've got, you move that there, is people describe this as sort of the horns of a cow, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is the entranceway. And then you can get sexual, that, that's the entranceway into the womb. Uh, and they describe this as a courtyard. Right. However, right, that's the, that's some historians and archaeologists describing it. If this was, if this was more of a gentle mound, right, um, and there's not really any courtyard there. It's just exaggerating something that we really don't understand, right? So that point given, Adam, anything? What what do you say? What does this feel right, Adam? Does it? Um, but having quite a, a relatively untrained eye, I, I intuit that it doesn't actually feel right, to be honest. That's just, just an intuition. Intuition is one of the best best tools us, us archaeologists have. I, I, I'm liking that. What sort of gives it away is not not looking right on the left and the right of the entrance. What what really gives it away of not looking right? You, you've, you've given that statement. Now, now give an answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Are you still there, Adam? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Um, you're, think you're thinking. It does. It does look. Uh, yeah, I am. Okay. Do you want, do you want me to come back to you? Come back to me. Come back to you. Okay. What we'll do? When we do the questions. Uh, we'll we'll come to that as an answer, right? So, again, looking in in from the entranceway. Uh, remember, it's 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 thirteen meters long from from the front from from the light at the front all the way to the back. And anyone who wants to say anything online, please do so. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Again, that's what it looked like in in the eighteen uh, eight, eighteen eighteen without it being reconstructed, right? So the entrance is on the left. That's what it looked like. So there's none of that. There's none of those stones um, on the left and the right. So, in other words, that to me looks like right. If we if we draw on here, the the profile looks as if it, it's more like that, right, all the way around with a little entranceway, um, which is sort of poking through. Right, that's what it looks like, right, rather than the reconstruction. So, anyway, moving on. So again, that there, um, maybe maybe the original frontage was actually, if we draw this in, hang on, oh God, where's that plan gone? Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. disappeared. Right, hang on. Oh, I've got to go back again. Blow. Let's draw this in. Right, maybe, because we know it's been reconstructed, because we're told it's been reconstructed. Right, thank you very much. You told us that. Maybe it was more like this. that would make more sense it, it, it's you know it, it would make more sense that it's just accessible and rather than rather than something a bit more grand um more, more of a more of a mound rather than um what's being displayed as an idea
Um, and there you go. There it is again, looking at this monument. Again, the entrance as we started with. I'm loving this image. This is really, really clear. Um, so that there, you've got the plaque on the right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Adam, do you want to answer that question now? Because we're going to questions. Anything spring to mind? Uh, okay, let's do questions. Yeah, no, I, I can't answer it. I can't articulate at the moment, but I'll, I'll okay. get back to you one day. <laughs> Okay, don't worry about it. It's fine. It's fine. I do believe yeah. people occasionally. It's okay. It's good to get people to think. Thank you very much for thinking anyway. Right, so what we're going to do, we're going to go and have uh, questions. And we're going to go... Uh, we'll start off with David. Any questions? No, thank you. David's disappeared there. Uh, right, we'll do Pat. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Right, we'll do Peter... The one actually who actually has hair. Uh, no, no questions. I'd, I'd not heard of that site before, and that was uh, interesting to see. The ammonite was stunning. Yeah, they would just be, just be good to see the why it's there and the setting, and try to understand mm. the monument from that. That yeah, I'd I'd agree. Uh, so Anne. No, I've done questions. Thanks. Okay. Um, right, um, Adam. Anything else? Nothing to add. I'm going to try and find this Otzi bloody reference. Um, Drida? Uh, yes, I've got a few. The picture is difficult to understand the size of it because there's no... You know, if you had someone standing there, you'd have a better idea how big it was. It's just should, an should observation. We, should, should we actually... I'm going to actually go online now and see if we can find another image that we've actually got some yeah. idea of scale. So that's what we're going to do. Ask your questions. Um, why would they put a wall there at all? Can't they just let it sort of the grass flow down? Uh, that's no what I feel like. I, 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 I feel that way. Uh, and also, <laughs> if you're going to get the effect of what stones were removed, right? That's the point. What stones were removed? If there were stones removed, they, they would have been the stones that made up the mound, the most loosest stones. So therefore, my assumption is it was a mound of stones rather than a mound of earth. Um, and that that would make more sense because if they're if they're quarrying material from here, what have they quarried away? Because they've not quarried away the main chamber. Yeah. So uh, you, yeah. you know what? This must be the only monument that nobody's actually stood. Hang on. <laughs> Is that a ghost? <laughs> oh, I got I got a woman's backside. Um, well, I've, got, oh, I've got more. Uh -huh. There's an Irish monument with a wall all around it. Uh, New Grange. Oh, the big one, yeah. But you, that's New Grange, yeah. Yes, yes, that's the one. So maybe they put walls around them? Uh, but then again, New Grange has been completely reconstructed on the outside. Oh, well, there you go. Mm. And you said so that... That, sure, that wall wasn't showing at New Grange when, um, in, in, in earlier photographs. And actually, you get, get an idea... Oh. That, yeah. that you can see that, oh, yeah. that there's um, there's a if, if that <laughs> if that woman's a standard size woman, right? Then she's slightly bent over as yes. she's going in because yeah. you've got the you've got the the um, skirt line there, and you can see her little legs. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Now, now you've got an idea of scale. So if she stood outside, right, her height would be. Yeah, ahead a bit, the outside top, wouldn't it? Yeah. There. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a bit, maybe that's a six foot person. So they've got, you've got to bend as you go in there. Okay. And the other thing was, you said the floor level may not have been, did you say it was lower or higher? When um, it was yeah. The, and the, why? Why would it I, be different? Unfortunately, no, it, it it looks like there's slabs on the base in there, right? Yeah. It it doesn't help that I haven't been there, right? It looks like there's slabs on the base towards the rear. But yeah. it looks like it looks like at the front, you can clearly see there that it looks there is earth at the front, right? Yeah. Uh, and and usually what we do with these sites, we excavate them, the ground level is lowered, then we put gravel in them and the ground level's raised. 
right? So uh, it's likely that the the level has always sort of been like that. But every single time you'd have got in there, you'd have you'd have bent over, right? Yeah. Yes. And yeah, carry on. Any, any yeah. anything else? I think that's about it. Yes. Right. We're going to search Otley the Ice Man uh, together. Uh, but I would I would like to. There's a question online, right? And somebody's talking about the fossil, right? Elise is talking about the fossil online. Um, and if we if we get the fossil up again, oh, hang on. So, um, there is actually an individual photograph of the fossil on you. Hang on a minute. If we type in fossil, it's always best to answer these correct fossil. Uh, there is an image of just the fossil. And it does look really, really clear. And it would have been much clearer then when they found it. Ah, which one do we go with? That one. Right. That there, right? That's not as clear as it could be. Um, there. Right, that'll do. Um, when you think about it, right, that's going to be quarried out. The the ribs on that are quite clear, right? So so um, that is the um, that that is the mold of the cast. Right, so where where is the stone? Where, where is the fossil that created that? Where did they put it? Because that's only the impression. Because be, for that to be so well preserved, they quarried both of them out of the same quarry at the same time. So where's the rest of it? Right, that's that that's that point. And the person online, Elise, says, "Love the fossil, beautiful site. Did the plaque damage original stones?" Or do you think was added to a restored area? Do you know what the answer is? I the answer is it, 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 it right. The answer is that has been restored. That the whole thing has been restored. You could tell that from Cole Hall's description. When you when you look on the left there, there's there's no stones. This is a cross section. There's no stones. The entrance is on the left. There's no stones showing on his plan. And what you can clearly see, I've just answered my own question, right? The, the cross section shows stones directly above the chamber. Therefore, it looks like it was a stony card rather than an earthen mound. So the whole thing may have been dubbed with stones, hence giving quarry material for the road that was constructed. What was it in the 1760s? Oh, oh, we've, we've also got to ask Pete now, and, I, and then, I, then I'm going to have a break. Do you know what, right? I always think that I've never got enough material for these lectures, right? Every single week. Just astounded the size of that, am that ammonite. It's the largest one I've ever seen. Yeah. Go read it, Pete. It's a big bugger. It and, and is. That, uh, again, Pete, the point is, is that um, the the... The, the, you know, the ammonite itself is rolling around somewhere. The actual fossil itself is somewhere, right? Yeah. They would have used it for something. But that would have been beautiful. It, as it came out the rock, it would have been crystalline. There would have been quartz. There would have been the silicates. It would be all there. It would be shining. It would be beautiful, right? That's just the impression. And, and, and it's so pure, that impression, that the fossil would have been with it when it came out the rock. And off. That, that, that that's freshly quarried. That's that's it. I, I I know my stone. If that had been a weathered impression, it would not be very clear. Mm. So, Adam, anything else, Peter? And we'll have a break. Um. Right, let's have a break. We've got five people watching online. Adrina, can you get on the drums in the break for ten minutes? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so I'll, I'll be I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a quick break, blow my nose a lot, and we'll be back at twenty past nine. Okay. Uh, Pat's then got ten minutes, so there we go. So uh, uh, twenty past nine. That, that's that's where we're back. <laughs>
Oh, we're missing Pat. Yeah. Hang on, we're missing uh, Peter C. Uh, we're missing the, the rest of uh, Drina's body, which is not really helpful. <laughs> You're better not seeing that, honestly. Uh, well, I don't see what problem you've got with that because Idris sees it every day. <laughs> True. <laughs> Do you know what? Are you trying to say that Idris is a better man than me? Don't answer that, Pete. <laughs> I was going to have a bloody cup of tea, but the kettle hadn't bloody boiled. So um, we we will. Uh... I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll have I'll have one of my weird drinks. Hang on a minute. I'll, I'll be back. I got one of my weird drink drinks were ready. Right, okay. Let's give it a bash. Oh god, blow my nose. Look at that. Oh god, bless me. Right. <coughs> It might be because I haven't put the heat on or something. I don't know. Oh, hang on a minute. I tell you what, why don't I wrap a blanket around me? Oh, or something. Gina, I need you to come over here and give me a cuddle. Just send your address. <laughs> oh. Don't, don't tell Peter you'll give me specialist treatment, okay? Because <laughs> he'll be getting really upset. I've even wrapped a blanket around me now. God, oh, I feel it a lot warmer now. Okay, right, so we're going to look at the third site. No, not third site. God, I've lost track. The fourth site. We're going to be going to Fengate. So I did mention that was the mystery. That was That's not the mystery site, but it's the site that... Um, I was going that I'd forgotten about, but we've still got the big one to go, and we did look at Otzi the Iceman. So I think to try and get into this now, I think we need to go to Google and we need to type in Otzi the Iceman. Right, this Peter, if this takes me, if this takes us down a weird, weird avenue, right? I did have a quick look, so it's more about his ancestry rather than where they think he lived, if that makes right, sense. Right, okay. O Otzi. Uh, the oh, I've lost ice... it again. I did just have it. Okay. Oh, well, we're, we're, we've got it online now. Otzi the Ice oh, oh, that was it. So you know how they normally expect people in this period to be a mix of Anatolian farmers and um, European hunter-gatherers or something like that? Yeah. But he was... He was a hundred percent Anatolian farmer. Oh God! But they were living in a par. Uh, uh, he said in, in a in a. Uh, what was it say? There it is.
Right. So here we go. Um, we'll just we'll just go with that. Oh, it says previous work suggests that Anatolians were in Europe at the time that Otzi Anatolians, i.e., from Turkey, um, were in Europe at the time that Otzi was alive. So it's not all that surprising that the mummy would have Anatolian ancestry. An ancient genome researcher um, says, uh, but the genome is a welcome addition to the detailed portrait that exists about his life and final hours. Um, I'm often asked if after 33 years, the Iceman research uh, shouldn't uh, everything be known. That's not the case. I think there will be always be new doors opening for research. I really appreciate that. So it, it does actually paint another picture. And when you think about it, if his mum and dad did come from Turkey, um, then they could have moved over the landscape over a period of time, or it could have been grandparents. It could have been a tribe. You don't know. Uh, it, just this one thing. Skin pigmentation markers reveal that Otzi had much more melanin in his skin than expected, making him darker than modern Sicilians. He also carried genetic markers for male pattern baldness. A bit like Pete. Considering his age and the mummy's missing hair, suspects that Otzi was balding when he died. So, Pete, he looked a bit like you. Oh, thank you. My, my pleasure, love. Don't, don't mention it. Right, so so we've done that now. Thank you for that, Peter. Uh, All right. we're, 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 we're back online, so we're going to go with the next bit of what we're going to do. And I hope, I hope, you know, doing this mixture of things um, it is it's quite useful some weeks rather than just being focused on one sub subject. I, 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 it allows me to flow. But next week we'll be doing the Nessa Brodka. Don't forget, again, reminder, don't forget you need your Nessa Brodka plan in front of you because if I say we're looking at building 23, you need it in front of you rather than me showing it on the screen every five minutes. This is number 23, but you want to have the plan there. It makes it flow. That's what we're doing next week. Right, so what we need to do now is we need... So we've done uh, all those images, loads of them, right? So what we need to do now is go to... There. Now, one of the things that we don't really see... Um, in our lectures is sets of skeletal remains. We usually talk about them or they they might be there or they might not be there. So uh, I I thought that obviously Fengate is going to be a site that's going to come up uh, near Peterborough, is a site that's going to come up in our lectures quite a lot when we're doing the Bronze Age. But we could equally be looking at the, um, at, at the Neolithic period. Uh, one thing about this site yeah, there it is. One thing about this site that we're looking at is it's very linked to another bronze. Uh, uh, it's very linked to a Bronze Age site, the excavations at Mutt's Farm, which were excavations of finding that really perfectly preserved Bronze Age site, later Bronze Age site, which naturally we'll be looking at. We've got so much to do in the Bronze Age. And I'm going to say this now as well. I, I've, I've been thinking about these Neolithic lectures and I thought, you know, we, we've we've done um, settlements, we've done houses, we've done some of their foodstuffs, we've done pottery, we've done the burials, we've done some of their belief structures, we've done big monuments, we've done small monuments, we've done this and that. I think we've done quite a quite a big overview of the Neolithic period. So I'm probably going to be quite happy to move on to the Bronze Age in probably about a month's time or so. So the and. The reason why I want to do this little bit now is that people's interpretation of history is not always right, right? That feature in front, you can actually see it, was believed to be Bronze Age, right? They thought it was Bronze Age. So let's read the piece. An excavation being undertaken in advance of construction some years ago of new industrial units has revealed a prehistoric ring ditch alongside um, a road in Fengate known as 
um, Jane Road. It was previously known from aerial photography, and actually, it's Bronze Age. Or is it? Uh, the type of ring ditch is often associated with Bronze Age round barrows, where a circular quarry ditch was dug to provide material for an internal mound since erased. Um, so obviously the mound's gone, but the ditch is still there. And those little things in there are actually the trenches, right? Uh, these are the little trial trenches that they've been digging, right? Sectioning, section trenches alongside this road. So if we go in, we know where we are. Oh, that's the other side. Um, I should have seen that then. Um, so we're basically in this area. So it's near the Must Farm site. Obviously, when this site was being looked at in the 1980s, nobody knew that the Must Farm site existed, then or not. So go back to this as they're looking, right? That they're, they're, they're and it's quite quite a heavy, clay, heaty like landscape, which it would be associated with uh, Peterborough. And by the way, Peterborough is not named after peat, as as in Peter's in soil. It's named after the figure. Um, so they'd made the mistake because when they excavated it, they, they actually started to find out that this monument was in fact Neolithic. It was in fact a Neolithic ring ditch. So the current excavation, um, so what we're seeing is that this site itself is very not a, uh, is very not a, um, and, and the coloration is not, not with the other coloration because it's an old photograph. Uh, th this, this is actually not um, a Bronze Age uh, ring ditch. It's actually a Neolithic building. It's one of those. And actually, um, you know, the, as I say, you get these buildings over different periods of time. And looking again at this reconstruction, so this, this, this building probably dates to the latter part of the Neolithic period, somewhere around 4,000, um, 4,006, 4,700 years ago or thereabout. And within the landscape, what, what they've actually found is, is that there's a massive plethora of uh, prehistory, pre right? There, there's lots of ditches and all sorts of things uh, with, within, hang on, go back. So you can actually see that. That's actually the site plan. And you can see that A is where there's a Neolithic house. B, the later Neolithic settlement, which is what we've just been showing you there, that, that, that building there, that circular thing in B. And within the landscape as well, there's Bronze Age material. And there's obviously, uh, there's obviously um, C, which is on there, which is on the opposite side of the road, which is actually an Iron Age settlement, right? So you've got a very rich prehistoric landscape so this has long since been bereft of its peaty climbs to be a landscape that's actively um, active in the prehistoric periods uh, lots of these lots of these lines drainage ditches boundaries um, creating sort of paddocks um, and and then when, when you when you think about this and you try to understand this this very interesting landscape what people have been doing is that they've been looking at this landscape uh, within Peterborough and Fengate for a very long time and again I wanted to sort of introduce this landscape to you now so the, the idea is there Peterborough we're going on to the Bronze Age Fengate we're going to the Bronze Age we're still looking at Neolithic stuff here and people in the past have 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 thought of these landscapes and examined these landscapes. There was, uh, it, this wasn't something that people were just looking at in the 1980s. They were, there, was a, there was an antiquarian called George Wyman Abbott. Um, and he started recording what he could find within the Fengate landscape near Peterborough. And he, he recognized the importance of this landscape that leads us on to a guy whose name will become very well known in our Bronze Age lectures, Francis Pryor, and obviously him working with Time Team and obviously within this landscape. So he recovered across this landscape um, various sherds of Neolithic pottery, 
uh, that he recognised as being Peterborough Ware. You see the link there, Peterborough Ware. Uh, what did what does Peterborough Ware look like? Well, if we if we just come out of this and we go we go and show you. Hang on, go there. Oh, hang on there. Uh, we can find this quickly. One, two, three. Where's the image of the pottery? Oh, come on. Where is it? There. Peterborough Ware uh, is number C. So Peterborough Ware is directly linked with this site and the landscape of Fengate. So if we go back out again and we go directly back to this site, right? And then we go back to his work. So this was one of those, one of those sort of um, archaeologist stroke antiquarians who was really sort of um, really started to record the landscape. Um, and, and there we go in 1920. So one, one thing, one thing again to sort of bring in the name Francis Pryor, and we'll just do this gently, and then we'll do the last major site. <coughs> You've actually seen already seen Im images of it, unfortunately, which has given the game away. Um, where's those images? Oh, damn, I just gave the game away again. Um, so there we go again. So look at this landscape. So Francis Pryor and prehistoric Fen Gate. Uh, Francis Pryor started from 1971 to unravel the prehistoric archaeological landscape of Fen Gate in advance of new industrial areas. His team um, returned to the site each year until 1978. Francis Pryor's excavations. Um, opened and understood this very rich prehistoric landscape and leading to the, the very excavations that we've been talking about since 1982. Uh, and within this landscape, they've been finding human remains. And the reason why there's a great deal of activity across this landscape as well, and why it's quite an interesting landscape when we look at the landscape in regards to Must Farm, is that not only is it a peaty landscape, it's also an extensively quarried landscape for light gravels. There's light gravels across this landscape as well. So that's why they're actually working there. And obviously they're, they're building industrial units. So this, this again, this is, there, there we go, an excavation of a late Neolithic ring, ring ditch directly associated with these buildings that you can actually see in the foreground. And when we actually go on to an understanding, um, it says, obviously Iron Age settlement, but that there is going to be very similar to these buildings associated with the Iron Age settlement as we actually go back to the plan, where we can see it now. There's the plan, where in other words, what we're trying to say is that rig ditches might have actually been used for burials in the Bronze Age. They may have actually been used for houses in the Bronze Age, may have actually been used for houses in the Neolithic period as much as they used for houses in the Iron Age. And on that moment, we're going to go to the last site, uh, which, which we're going to give it away now. And we've got actually all those images. And this monument there, has anyone ever seen that before? Anyone? No. no. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Carlian. Nope. <laughs> even if, if there you go, looking into it, give you an idea of scale. That gives you an idea of scale there. This is not Carlian. This is actually, I'll show you precisely where it is. It's on Shetland. Oh. <laughs> and I went to Shetland. I went to see my lecturer. We stayed on Shetland. We were there. And uh, I, I, I don't know why my lecturer didn't even mention this site, but this is, this, is, this is a massively important Neolithic site, which I've never, ever heard of. And, um, and I, I was just, I, what, it, what it was, I was, I, I was rescheduling this lecture, and I just thought, right, I wanted to do a mix match for sites, and I wanted to find something big. Anyway, didn't find anything. Well, some, the, the site that we've seen is Somerset. That, that's, that's quite a big site. This site, I, I just thought, right, I haven't really looked at Shetland. And I thought, there it is. And basically, it, it, it's, a, it, it's a really intriguing site. 
And you get an idea of scale there for those individuals inside it. And there it is from the aerial photography. Right? I don't know. And you've got, there's a little gate on it, and you can go in. And I, I, I looked at this and I thought, wow, I've got to do this. It does look like a bit like the Roman Amphitheatre at Killian. I've got to be honest with you, Pete. It's a bit smaller than Roman Amphitheatre at Killian, but this site itself, I really thought I wanted to tell you about it. And, and I'm going to ask, has anyone ever seen this site? If not, then that's all of us. Um, I, I What I did, as I'm doing my research on this, Obviously, I've got books. I've got I've got the internet. I thought, right, okay, I'm going to go on the internet on this one. And I did want to do the site of Giles Hoff, which is more of an Iron Age site, which, which we'll come on to again. That's a major site in on the um, island of Shetland, Giles Hoff, and also uh, Scatness, which was part of my uh, my work on on um, on the island. So I typed in um, Neolithic. Shetland's Neolithic period falls between four to five five thousand years ago, and it is characterised by the introduction of agriculture and farming. Now, there's a bit more blurb there. This period is sometimes known as the New Stone Age, as sees the first farmers arrive and settle in Shetland. Well, one of the things is that while I was in Shetland, uh, Dr. Simon Clark he actually showed me uh, Mesolithic areas. Uh, areas that had been being eroded away with like Mesolithic evidence, right? So there were people living on Shetland in the Mesolithic period. How they got there, that's another kettle of fish. He basically said, uh, hey, Carl, how did people get to Shetland? I said, well, obviously it was because it was linked to, um, it was linked to Orkney at one stage and Scotland. And he smiled and says, no way, right? Uh, because, because, from Orkney to Shetland is quite a distance, really. And, and, and the, the water's quite deep, right? So it, it may have been accessible via ice a lot earlier, but that's something else. So um, the person writing this, they, they basically said that uh, some of my favourite remnants of Neolithic Shetland are the standing stones that punctuate the landscape in many places. Yeah, but they could be Bronze Age as well. The best example is the, prob is the probable, uh, probably found near Lunt in Unst which is one of the islands. But if you train your eye, you'll find them scattered throughout the landscape. And then I come across this site. Stannydale Temple is a must-see. And why I didn't bloody see it when I was on Shetland, I do not know. I really don't. Set in the heart of Shetland, West Mainland, a short walk takes visitors into Neolithic Shetland and back in time, some plus 4,000 years ago. The heel-shaped megalithic structure or temple, the only one of its kind in Shetland, remains shrouded in mystery and intrigue tucked into the empty landscape. Well, I'm going to say bloody hell, I don't know of another example like this anywhere either. I've never seen anything like this before. I've, 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 I've been involved in archaeology for decades. I've not seen anything like this before. This, this for me, is a shock. So I thought, right, I've got to do this. I've really got to do this. And uh, so so my notes. So let's go to my notes. And uh, and we, we've got we, we've got a little bit of information on this. And, and I, it would be nice to sort of maybe talk about what you feel it is. What, what, what is it? So it's known as the Stannydale Temple, right? It's a Neolithic site. It's near a little village called Stannydale, and it's 21 miles away from the capital city of Shetland, which is Lerwick. So I was basically um, within a, you know, it was just down the road. I don't know why. I, I don't know why I didn't know it was there. I had no idea. Now. The writers say that this actually once had a roof on it. And all that remains is a walled enclosure. Now, if they're not, and okay, oh God, what I should have done is I should have said, what do you think this is? And uh, usually everyone would say it's a burial chamber, but no, they, they say it was actually 
a proper building, right, with a roof on it. <coughs> right? um, and to sort of give you an idea of scale again, if we if we look with those people inside it, that sort of gives you an idea of scale, right? That gives you an idea, idea of scale. They said there was a roof on it. Now, I'm gonna, I, I, not that I've really studied this site, but the inside area of this is the inside area of the trilophon stones at Stonehenge, if anyone's been in there. And that's a fairly big area anyway, if you're trying to roof it. Um, this is what they're saying, it was a roof on it. And there is uncertainty about the original purpose of the building, where its unusual site indicates some communal purpose or that it was possibly the home of an important person. Well, two, I'm not going to go with the home of an important person. If you've got a home of an important person, you need hundreds of people to support that important person. So let's go with the community use, right? If you're going to put a roof on this, right, they must have had mighty big bloody trees to do it. Big trees, big tree trunks, trees that have grown over 100 years to actually create the length that you need to span this building. If you go to Shetland today, they've got they've got trees, but they're all sycamores, and they actually happen to live in the city of Lurwick, which, which is which is twenty one miles away from you, right? And and they, they've got these lovely um, grey um, hooded crows. Anyway, I love them; they're great. So the building lies today within a field of about eight acres. And if we if we go to the aerial view, this is why I needed the aerial view, right? If you go to the aerial view, there's nothing around it. There's absolutely nothing. Oh, by the way, that line on there, when I did the aerial, when I did the aerial photo, when, when I took when I took this off the internet, it, it seemed that uh, that's where there was another photograph taken on the other side. It was all the same colour across anyway. So um, so the building lies um, uh, in the building lies within a field of about eight acres, almost completely surrounded by a dry stone wall. Right. So so this this landscape is surround, which which is probably nothing really to do with it. The field contains two smaller stone stone houses and about thirty mounds of stone. Well, I can't see any of those mounds of stone, but you've got other mounds of stone that might indicate a settlement. The stones would have been cleared from the field to enable cult cultivation. So um, are those stones piled up in the field? Instead of being buildings, are they part of, um, as it says, field cultivation? Or is it part of a much wider settlement? Because we don't really know what's under those stones. And this, this itself is from, from around, roughly probably from around five or um, four and a half thousand years ago, leading into um, the Bronze Age directly. Now, pottery should show that it was also occupied into the late Bronze Age and the Iron Age. And for me, I I'm, I'm loving this because it, it's just like something I've never known about. I didn't know, I had no idea. This is so, this is so interesting. It really, really is. And, and, and it would surprise me if any of you guys have been there, right? I'm not saying none of us have traveled, but, you know, you would have needed to have known this was there, to have visited it. So it says, I've got no images of these at all. The smaller houses both have a, a large central space and some smaller rooms. Well, okay. Uh, the main building, this building, heel shaped with a concave facade as are other Neolithic buildings in Shetland. It has a shallow crescent-shaped forecourt. Um, so that, that's the forecourt in the middle. And an alcove outside the door may have been a guard room, right? So um, so what, what, what you've basically got, you're talking about guard rooms and all sorts of things. The building has entered from the... Ah, right, okay, I've made a mistake there. The foot is saying that the forecourt was outside there. The forecourt is in the area in front. Okay, let's redo that. The forecourt is outside the entrance. So the entrance is obviously, um, sorry, I made that mistake. Uh, the entrance is actually in there. And they're talking about a guard room there somewhere as well. Um, 
and the buildings walls enclose an oval area that's the that's the area inside not the forecourt the area inside that's the oval area and this is um just under 12 and a half meters long by just under seven meters wide uh with six shallow recesses now i have actually the roof for my building is actually um the diameter of my building is 6.5 meters uh but obviously it's 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 spanned by two lengths of timber um which which meet in the middle right i don't have timber going across the whole thing so it's doable it's doable if you've got the material if you've got the roof of material to do it now in absence of evidence what do they say in absence of if you if you've got no evidence of timber right on Orkney or Shetland. Therefore, they had no timber to use. But now what we have found, and we're going to talk about this next week, when they've excavated in Orkney, they've now started to find timber, suitable pieces of timber that may have been used for planking on the floor or even roofing timber, which is really, really important. So the game is changing. The game is very changing, right? So excavations have found two posts two post holes along the axis of the oval that each contain the carbonized remains of a spruce post, which was nearly a foot wide. The species of spruce, a Norway, a Norway spruce, <laughs> is not native to Scotland. The posts were presumably driftwood carried across from Scandinavia. Right now, right. There's a point to be made here, right? In, in my notes, right? There's a point to be made. Hmm. When, when we talk about Scarabray, and we talk about timber may have been used for Scarabray, they always talk about timber being washed up on the shoreline, right? But as we now know, at the Nessa Brodgill on mainland Orkney, but they've actually got evidence of timber, it's really unlikely that timber's been washed up on the shore. You can't wait all your life to uh, wait for timber to be washed up on the shoreline, right? Um, so it is like it, it would have grown on the island of Orkney as much as timber would have actually have grown on Shetland, right? And who's to say that uh, Norwegian spruce, spruce didn't actually grow on Shetland at this stage? And the floor of the building also contained charcoal from Scots pine. Now, as far as I know, Scots Pine has been completely wiped out uh, in Shetland, right? But I can't, don't quote me on that. It's definitely gone from most of Orkney anyway. Uh, the building most likely had a wooden ridge roof. There would have been few, if any, trees on the island, but I, I'm not going to go with that, right? Um, driftwood must have been plentiful since it would have taken... 700 meters of timber to construct the roof. Absolute bloody nonsense. Uh, sorry again. You're not going to get um, wood. You're not going to get, let, let's work this out. Um, let's work this out logically. You're not going to get 70, 10 meter lengths of wood to span that roof, right? Washed up on the shoreline. Uh, so is that right? So, 10 times, well, whatever I've done with the maths there. But, but no, 100. Yeah. And what have I done there? No, that's right. 70, 10 metre. That's right, isn't it? But what I'm trying to say, right, is that even today, you don't get that quantity of wood washed up on our shoreline, right? L lots of wash wood is naturally eroded from all over the place, right? But you don't get lengths of that wood. So I, I'm going to argue that there was actually wood. If you're going to roof this, and also... After you'd roofed it, you'd have to maintain the roof. And you're not just talking about beams for the roof. You're talk, having to talk about lattice work to support whatever you're going to put on the roof as well. Right. Now, this site, again, let's, let's move the image again. Right. This site itself, that, that's, when, when you think about it, even, hang on, even though that's not very clear, right, you can see the recesses a little bit better, right? Um, in 1949, a certain Charles Calder explored this site. He said it was a temple. The name struck. The name stuck simply because he believed this looked like lots of sites on the continent, like Malta, 
circular sites like this, like Mediterranean temples. It does, believe me, it does look like Mediterranean temples. We've done that in some other lectures. He saw a strong resemblance to these temples. And he said as follows, I'm gonna take a slurp a minute. It is almost impossible not to assume that the Maltese temples are the prototypes from which Stanleydale is derived and which solve the question of its purpose. But I shame Andy's not here today because he gets really angry when he mentioned ritual and things that go like that, right? And yeah, why can't it have just been a big sort of meeting area which was undercover? Or actually, like a market area. Do you know when, when we've uh, looked at Scarabray? We've done Scarabray, but they, they've said that um, the, the the streets and the recesses in the streets that are outside the houses at Scarabray, that may have represented people having little booths, in a sense, of enclosed markets in the little streets. Well, there you go. But, uh, but the theory stuck this being a temple. Other archaeologists have cast out, but agree that the building is unique as Shetland. I would agree with that. I'd agree it's probably unique in the whole of the British Isles. Are the period and apparently being designed uh, for a very special purpose. Now, uh, we're, we're actually coming to the end now. Excavations have found sherds of Bronze Age pottery, but likely to be earlier pottery, flat-based pottery. And they found the evidence of burnt barley grains inside this building. Also the remains of sheep and cattle inside this building. One of the buildings outside this site, one of the smaller buildings that they're discussing, had saddle cones and grain rubbers. Now, um, I, I not really aware of that term grain rubbers, it's totally new to me, but uh, which would have been used to grind the barley. So grain rubbers, that might, might must be like a pebble, um, which, as it said, were used to grind the barley. So this site itself is, is, is for me, um, a really interesting, enigmatic, powerful site. And surrounding this landscape, there's there's loads of little mounds that might be associated with, with a miniature town. Bloody hell, a town in the Neolithic period in Scotland. God, who would have countenanced it? And obviously we're talking about these holes here. These two would have been to hold the foot in diameter or thereabouts spruce that supported the roof. And I gotta be honest with you, right? I know something about supporting roofs, right? Um, they wouldn't have supported a roof. They, they, there needs to be more of them. The weight, the weight of the timber on that ridge would have been excessive. Um, so obviously we get an idea of the scale in there. Um, there they are examining. And what we've got there again, looking into the to the site again, looking at all the recesses, big chunky stones. And again, looking from the entranceway. And looking out of the site, again, give you, give you an idea of scale. It's not a small site. It's really not a small site. That roof would have been absolutely bloody massive. Again, looking at where the site is. And Stanley Dale's temple. And that is a little video about some pirate stuff. Other than that, what we're going to do, we're going to call that a day, but we're just going to show you, we're just going to go back and just, let you see this aerial view. And that hopefully is something that none of you have ever seen before. And uh, anyone else watching online, there's, there's a few of you. Uh, thanks for joining us online as well. Anyone online got any questions, but anyone with my gang now, let's just see if you've got any questions and we'll go there. And we're gonna, David, straight up on the screen. David, any questions? No, thank you. Thank you, David. Who else have we got? Um, uh, Peter. No. No. No, you're not there. No. <coughs> oh, yeah, you're Pete. Pete. <laughs> Those two uh, stone piles in the set in, in the middle there, couldn't they not have been stone pillars to hold the roof up? 
Oh, ba ba basically, actually, when you say stone piles, they, if you if you look again, right? If if you if you look again, right? They were um, no, that those black things are the holes. Um, so it looks like there's it looks like there's another one there. But but there's these two are the main ones that had evidence mm. of the Norwegian spruce in the hole. So okay. they're actually settings for the posts. Is there anything else, Pete? Pete? No, that's it. No. Right. Okay then, uh, Peter. No, I think you you mentioned the one thing that I was thinking about is uh, with a stone building like that whether it was for ritual religious purposes or for congregational living and something, you'd still, the way it looks there, you'd expect smaller structures or wooden structures to be to be placed around. You wouldn't expect something like that in isolation. There's something about it that feels like it was part of a selection of things rather than by itself. And I don't know what it is about it. It's just... It, it's, there's, there is something odd. It's almost as if this is the massive thing in the middle of nowhere and there's nothing mm. else, but there is other things because there's mounds, but surely mm. they would stand out as much as this one. I know what you're saying. It's a bit weird. Mm. It gives a different feeling to the, the chambered tombs and long barrows. Very oh, there different is a massive, feeling. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks more like, you know, from the, the above plan, it looks more like Scarabray or a house at a, uh, you know, town. like one of these yeah. Cornish ancient villages or something like that. It's got that sort of feeling to the to the to the shape of it. But I don't know. It's, that is a new one on me. Uh, it's a new one on me. It's completely yeah. it, it, that that's thrown me, and it's good to have something to throw you occasionally. It really is. Mm. That that yeah, you can put a bit of Cornwall in there. You can put a bit of Scarabray in there. This is Shetland. I've never seen anything like that before. Mm. Mm. Thank you for that, Peter. Uh, so we're getting through these quickly tonight. Um, Elise online, she said, they're still here. Adding Shetland is my bucket list. I'm excited that Otzi has been added to the archaic DNA um, um, project on, on Gen Match, whatever that is. Right, okay then, Drina. Could they have used whale bones? For a big support? bloody whales, but uh, yeah, yeah, um... there is, yeah, there is evidence of whale bones being used in on Orkney um, and Shetland. But obviously, whale bones have a limited. You can have big whale bones, but to use whale bones on a roof like that, you you obviously need a central um, superstructure uh, on the roof, and and it's, it's you you yeah you would need more than just whale bones. Okay. Whale bones may have been, but there's no evidence of whale bones either. So uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah. Right. Who else have we got left? We got Pat, um, Adam. We'll do Adam next. Uh, nothing to add to, though, uh, to that but uh, that's great thank you very much my pleasure um, Pat well it's very impressive very impressive it's too bad it's so far away <laughs> uh, it is a lot further than Orkney lovely yeah it is too bad it's far away it would be good to be there on a summer day just to sit in the middle look at the place yeah exactly yeah a feel um, and then yeah. finally Finally, let's see if there's any questions from Anne. It's a shame we didn't have Margaret and Andy tonight, but Anne. It, it's perhaps a silly question, but when you look at the aerial view, the grass on the monument looks sort of groomed compared with what's around it. And is that done just to impress visitors or, you know? It's uh, yeah, kind of... it, yeah it, it is to impress visitors. That's a typical... Uh, Scottish uh, maintenance. It, it, it is mode. It is to do look like that, and, and that's what exactly what they do with Scarabray. Yeah, right. They they they've got a lot of pride in their monuments. Um, uh, Scottish heritage. Oh. They really do. Thanks. If, if if Scottish heritage was responsible for all of our archaeological sites across Britain, we'd we'd have a different. But yeah. They've got a good way of maintaining their sites. So yeah. um, thank you for that, Anne. If you haven't got anything else to say, Anne, I'm just going to say um, tonight, don't forget, we're doing the Nessa Brodger next week. I uh, really appreciated you taking part. And don't forget, if you ever want to join online on a Sunday evening, um, 8 o'clock to you and me ramble on YouTube, you're very welcome. And obviously, 
you're very welcome to join us anytime. And we've got another illicit pillar coming in about a month's time. Exciting because we've got a lot going on at this minute. So um, I'm going to ask finally anything else to say, Adam, David, uh, Pat, and uh, Peter, Peter, or Gina. If not, we're going to call it a day. And thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Okay. Good, good night, Gina, night. Peter, night. Peter, yeah. David, you. And good night. Adam, and Pat. Good night, folks. Cheers, night. Pal. Thank night, you. everybody. My pleasure. My pleasure. Take care. That was all fine. Everyone went. So uh, if I want to keep them any more to ask if anyone's going to pack a Smarties, it's gone. But anyone else online now, please, please say something. And, uh, um, it would be nice for anyone to... Uh, If anyone would like to say anything, please do now. But if not, I could look in a chat box. Uh, uh, yeah, my chat box, my OCD look in a chat. Nobody's put anything in a chat box tonight. You're usually on a Wednesday night. Um, I, I'm going to uh, say as well, don't forget we're on tomorrow, Wednesday at 7.30 and in the morning at 11 o'clock. Uh, thank you very much, Elise. Um, it is great live, very informative. And thank you for taking part and everybody else online. Thank you for taking part. I'm going to call it a day now. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you for everybody's continued support online. And come and join us on Sunday. It's a bit of a weird one on Sunday again. And uh, and hopefully, um, you know, we'll, we'll just go from strength to strength. Keep watching my, my stuff. And uh, again, thank you for your support. Like and subscribe. No, no, Elise and everybody else and uh, everybody else who's who's just joined us online as well. I'm, I'm off now. So this is the lecture. You can watch it on Rewind, uh, Replay. And well, um, again, this is my little bit of a waste of time. Nothing in a chat box on three, two, one, done. OK, no, night, no, folks. No, no, I'm off. Good night. Thank you, everyone.